Coming up on Banzai, we go to Kobe to enjoy their world-renowned beef. We shack up in a capsule hotel for the night. And we say goodbye to our beloved Japan. Hey guys, it's Lala and welcome back to Banzai. We have really come a long way since the start of the 2019 Rugby World Cup six weeks ago. And we've really enjoyed bringing you closer to the home of the 9th RWC. But today our hearts are a little sore because this is our last episode. So we're going to try to go out with a bang. Now, no trip to Japan is complete without tasting Kobe beef. So that's exactly what we did. And we went straight to the source. Of course, you can't go to Paris and not check out the Eiffel Tower. Just like you can't visit Kobe and not try out their world famous beef. Which is why we hit the streets of Kobe in search of a Yakiniku Kobe beef restaurant that was good enough to take my taste buds on a trip, but also to learn about the history and quality of Kobe beef. As it turns out, Shingen was just the place. <laughs> 肉に対しての食文化なかった。うん。家畜よ in Japanese history, up until the Meiji period, we didn't eat cows. People were using cows as domestic animals to help with the cultivation. As they are very powerful, they were used for plowing rice fields. However, when Meiji period started, Japan decided to open the country to foreign trade and diplomatic relations. So this was when the time foreigners could enter Japan. They came through the Nagasaki, Kobe and Yokohama ports, which were the only three that accepted foreign ships. When the Kobe port was opened, it became very popular, so many foreigners were coming to Kobe. It wasn't long before they were requesting to eat beef. But at that time in Japan, we didn't have the culinary culture of eating beef, so it was prohibited to kill cows to eat them at that time. The foreign people insisted they really wanted to eat beef and asked if there was any way. Eventually, the people of Japan said, buy one cow and take it back to your ship to slaughter, which they did. They were shocked at how delicious the beef was. They went back to their country and told their people, if you go to Japan, you need to try Kobe beef. And this is how it started. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. It was just that good. Even better than I expected. I mean, the meat just melts in your mouth. And with all the different sauces on offer, each bite had a different flavor. In Kobe, beef is not just beef. It's a delicacy that is carefully looked after in order to maintain its reputation. Now, Chef told us the process they use to produce their world famous meat. Japanese Kobe beef is called Japanese black normally. It is known worldwide as the best beef in Japan. How they raise the cows and how they eat the beef is different to anywhere else in the world. In other countries, they graze the cows, but in Japan, we keep them in pens. The pens form a grid pattern. We keep five cows in each. The reason we make a lot of pens like this is because when we have five cows in one pen, there will always be one cow which gets pushed out of the group. This is the one that gets bullied. Then we take all the bullied cows and put them in a pen together. Well, five cows per pen, of course.
This award-winning restaurant, Shingen, is one of three franchises in Kobe. And what can I say? It really is beautiful from the decor, the feel of it, and of course the food and amazing world-class service. It was really a five out of five in my books. Now, like me, you may have heard the famous story about Kobe cattle being given beer and massages, which makes their meat so good and unique. But I just had to find out if it was really true. <laughs> no, they don't eat apples and drink beer. They eat soya beans and corn and some nutrition that we compound. What an experience! I mean, the cattle may have not been given beer and massages, but Kobe beef sure does taste magical, like nothing I've ever tasted before. And I would totally urge any beef lover out there to come over and try it. A landmark here in Kobe is the Kobe Nuno Biki Herb Garden and Ropeway. And one of the best ways to get a glimpse of the city and even a little bit of Osaka is from right up here. Now Japan of course has four very distinct seasons and this little paradise shows off its unique flowers and herbs for summer, spring, winter and autumn. Now it being the latter, cosmos and sage are everywhere. This Kobe Nunobiki herb garden was built 25 years ago. Long ago, we had much older gondolas for the cableway, but we replaced them about eight years ago. Many years ago, a natural disaster took place here. There was heavy rain and a mudslide. After that, the townspeople decided to turn this place into a garden and create a tourist spot. This beautiful establishment has a cable car system in place called the Shin Kobe Ropeway and is one of Kobe's major tourist attractions, especially for those who enjoy taking the scenic route. We have 54 gondola cabins all working at one time. They all come out from the garage and they move around on the cableway rail. They move at a speed of 4 meters per second. So from the bottom to the top, it takes around 12 to 13 minutes. As the herb garden is on top of the mountain, we made the mid station so that the people can enjoy walking in the garden. Normally, cableways only have bottom and top, but we created a midpoint which makes our facility more unique. It must not be easy to maintain four hectares of herb garden, which had me wondering how many herbs and flowers can be found here at any given time of the year. There are 200 kinds, and we have 75,000 stubs a year. It is changing depending on each season. We have 20 maintenance staff who clean and do maintenance every day. Besides these people, we have five planners who design and oversee the plans of the gardens. They also check the gardens and we do the maintenance every day according to their instructions. Besides the ropeway, the Kobe Nunobiki Herb Garden has many facilities for tourists to enjoy. We have foot baths, we have a museum where you can enjoy the different fragrances, we have a restaurant here on the top platform where you can enjoy the food using the herbs from our garden. Over there we have a place where you can take in the beautiful view in a cafe and we also have a spice exhibition. On top of that we have hammocks in many places in the garden so that you can relax. Although it was a gloomy day, it was still a lot of fun admiring Kobe and its beautiful gardens. We caught up with some of the tourists as they shared their experiences of the establishment and of Kobe. Tell us, what made you come over to the Herb Garden and Ropeway? We came to Kobe for to try out the beef, obviously, but also wanted to get a really nice view of the, of the city, so we want to try that out and then 
realized there's this garden attached to it with uh, this all this this um, you know tons of uh, like seasonal uh, herbs um, and all these like different gardens you can check out. It was super nice. I really had no idea there was a garden at the top. I hadn't read about it for some reason. Uh, but in that sense, we 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 came mostly for the view, and that would probably be also my favorite part. But uh, then we got so much more because there is like there's a. a a German village almost here that we had no, de no idea about. So uh, in general, just super nice uh, surprise, I would say. What was your favorite part of this herb garden? Oh man, um, I would have to say the rope ride, the rope way up. Just the views were spectacular. The photo opportunities were amazing. Just, uh, yeah, it was great. How about you? What was your favorite part of the entire experience? I think seeing the city skyline, it's, it's really wonderful to be able to see that much of Kobe. I think the first surprise was how high up this little ropeway goes. I thought this midpoint station was at the top, and I was like, wait, we're going more up? <laughs> For all you bird watchers and plant lovers out there, this is a perfect place to relax in nature, admire beautiful scenery, and learn more about flora. Stay with us. After the break, we check out what goes down at the SA Tourism Office in Japan. We check in at a capsule hotel in downtown Tokyo. Plus, we give you a recap of all the amazing moments we've had bringing you Banzai all the way from Japan. Well, since we've been away for quite a few weeks, our crew grew a little homesick, which is why we went on the hunt for anything Mzanzi. And we came across the home of SA Tourism, and we wanted to find out more. Now, you may remember the friend I made at the Halal Ramen restaurant in episode five. Manso Mohammed, who works for SA Tourism in the Asia Pacific region. Now, in an effort to further motivate you to come to Japan and enjoy this amazing country, we drop by the SA Tourism office in Tokyo. Hang on, I think it's amazing that they even have an SA Tourism office in Japan. SA Tourism um, Japan offices have been around for about 45 years. I would estimate in the 1970s it's been established in, in, uh, um, in, in Japan. Um, so we've had a presence since then. I think first in the South Africa Embassy and later we established the office here about maybe more than 15 years ago. Japan is a very important market for South Africa. Every year we receive about 27 to 30,000 arrivals from Japan to South Africa. So the purpose of the office in Tokyo to serve the whole of Japan is to market South Africa in Japan to the Japanese people. As the hub head of the Asia-Pacific region, Mansur takes care of the SA tourism offices and trade relations in countries such as Japan, China and South Korea, among others. Sounds like fun, but I don't think it's an easy task. The hub's responsibility is, in my case, um, countries like Japan, China, South Korea and one or two other surrounding countries in this region. And the purpose of my job is to be effectively the country manager in each one of these countries and to promote South Africa, to manage the marketing budget, to manage the, the local staff and to manage the relations with the trade in each one of these countries. I've got amazing staff in the region. The first point of call for me is the local staff. I've got two members of the staff here in the Japan office in Tokyo, um, Yuka Kondo and Akiko Isaka. Um, so they've been with South African tourism for 14 years. When I arrived here, they gave me the most amazing soft landing. They taught me just about everything I know about the Japan tourism market. And that's the primary level of support from the Japanese government side. They've been very kind to South Africa and always been very supportive, especially the Japan Association of Travel Agents, JATA, the Japan National Tourism Organization, the Japan Tourism Board, all of them are always coming over and asking us if there's anything more they can do for us to promote South Africa in Japan. Mansour elaborated on how the Rugby World Cup has been a perfect opportunity to market South Africa as a tourist country. 
the Japanese are very passionate about rugby. Rugby is probably the most important event um, just before the Olympics of next year, especially the Rugby World Cup in Japan, to position South Africa as a preferred tourism destination. So we have done a lot of work in terms of campaigning around the rugby. Um, certainly the Springboks are very popular. I believe the Springboks are Japan's second favorite. For some of us, it's the favorite, but we won't tell that to everybody, right? Well, I have been urging Africans to come and visit Japan because it is truly amazing. But Africa has just as many wonders as well. So, for once on Banzai, we have the awesome opportunity to promote South Africa just as well as Japan. The work that I do here is to promote South Africa. I don't think anybody could wish for a better job than to promote their country in another country, especially a country like South Africa. Because we are so unique, we've got an amazing history. You know, in South Africa, we've got our single biggest asset, and that is our people. Our people will sell anything. Um, the beauty of our people, the tolerance of our people towards others, and certainly the welcoming nature of South Africans to people overseas. South Africa is one of the few places in the world where people are very welcoming to other people, similar to how Japan is to other people. You know, the Japanese people are pressed for time. They don't have very long holidays. But for a first-time visitor, that is absolutely perfect. You know, they can come to South Africa, they can enjoy the beautiful wildlife, they can enjoy the beautiful scenery, they can enjoy the amazing gastronomy and food that South Africa has to offer. Most importantly, the people. Now, all of that comes very cheap. South Africa may be a long place to travel to, and I always tell them this, but once they're there, they wouldn't want to come back to Japan because not only is it beautiful, but it's also very affordable. We spent the last two months showing you Japan, and I've had so much fun doing so, which got me thinking, if ever I wanted to come to Japan on a micro budget, what are some of the ways in which I could have fun in Japan without putting a huge dent in my pocket? Which is why I went over to the nine hour capsule hotel to see what kind of affordable accommodation they had to offer. So nine hour capsule hotels offer a minimum function for one night stay, which is shower, sleep, and preparation and we offer the best quality in those three fields so usually it's 4,900 yen per night and uh, it differs by season in the weekends it's a little bit more expensive and uh, weekdays it might get cheaper and you can you can also use just for short sleep just a nap short nap to one hour two hours nap or just a shower for under a thousand yen it almost feels like I'm in a sci-fi movie in here, which I thought was kind of cool. So I wanted to know when and how the concept of capsule hotels began in Japan. So it started about 30 years ago in Japan, in Osaka, and it was for business person who stayed work for work late at night or really drink all night and didn't want to use taxi to go home because it's so expensive in Japan. So staying in a capsule hotel was a cheap option for them and it was really a place where for people who didn't really have money and who wanted to stay cheap at overnight. Nine Hour Capsule Hotel has 129 capsules available to customers and each floor is separated for either males or females. And no guys, you are not allowed to share a capsule unless it's with your child below the age of six. Given the price and comfort provided by this capsule hotel, there is a good mix of customers who frequent it. So it's a really a mix of Japanese people and overseas people. 50% Japanese people, 50% overseas tourists for business use, for students who want to stay at a reasonable price, uh, overseas tourists to backpackers. We have people from Asia, North America, South America, Africa, and everywhere in Europe. And some people who just want to enjoy the capsule hotel experience. 
So I'm not gonna lie, when I first heard about pods um, and capsule hotels, I always thought, nah, that's not for me. But now that I'm actually in one, guys, this is actually pretty cool. It's nice and cozy. It serves all the basic functions that you, that you need, because at the end of the day, if you're here in Tokyo, you're gonna spend most of the time outside exploring um, and doing cool things. So all you really need is a place to put your bags, obviously get a good night's sleep and shower, and this does all of that. Plus, you can of course charge all your phones here, and these little nooks, of course, are there for your cell phone, for your glasses, your contact lenses. But there's also plenty of space around the sides uh, to put anything down if you need to. Any of your bags, your valuables can all kind of fit right in this pod. Sure, this is the view, but at the end of the day, when your eyes closed, it doesn't really matter. So, on that note, it's time for me to take a quick siesta and uh, enjoy this little capsule. Well, there you have it. Now, I think I might have successfully eliminated any excuses you may have about coming over to Japan. So, save up, guys, and travel. Wow, Japan really has so much to offer. And even though we've been here for quite a few weeks, we've been scratched the surface. Like, Lucky for you, Supersport will be continuing to cover all the entertaining sport, including the World Olympics, which will be taking place right here in Tokyo in 2020. So be on the lookout for that. Now, before we wrap it up, here's a quick recap of everything Banzai. Being back in Japan after being raised here a little bit as a child, obviously a lot of memories were brought back. It was quite emotional coming back and for two months too, right? That's a really long time. So I was really able to immerse myself fully in back into Japanese culture and society and uh, we got to travel a lot as well. So seeing, you know, most or at least a lot of the country was also wonderful for me. But just kind of the nostalgia uh, that this trip has brought for me was incredible because it was so normal being in Japan and living and you know just kind of following the rules and regulations here and now coming back the mzanzi lala and going oh yes I can't do this oh, oh, oh I'm sorry I'm sorry excuse me and I just have to like apologize for everything because I'm always getting in the way of someone <laughs> Woo! Okay, so your ninja just did it. I'm not scared of many things. Wait, I'm not scared of one thing. Is your is your camera lens clean? Is it fine? Just fine. Just just double check. I just see something on your on your thing there. So being in Japan with an all South African team who's never been to Japan before was pretty interesting to say the least because obviously like there are a ton of rules and regulations and, and I had to kind of um, make sure that everybody kind of didn't offend anyone. Even me, I had to make sure that I wasn't offending anyone. You need to read the rules before you come here because there are so many. Um, but yeah, I think it was funny watching some of the guys talking on the phone in the bus and that kind of thing, which is like a big no in Japan. Um, and it was kind of almost endearing because you're like, oh, home. That's how they do it at home, you know? So yeah, the guys did really well though. I think within just a short couple of days, everyone kind of got into the swing of things and then it was just easy going from there. So guys, it's been a fantastic day out here at the Herb Garden in Kobe. Oh my goodness, we're going down. <laughs> hey you guys, welcome back to the show. Listen, it is super early morning right now. It's 5 a.m. It's 5 a.m. Wow. Guys, it really is 5 a.m. I can't freaking speak. Obviously, Banzai being a show that was really focused on the lifestyle aspect of the Rugby World Cup, we got to do a lot of fun things to do with Japan. We got to travel a lot, we got to eat a lot of great food uh, and meet some really cool people too. And I think it's really hard to give you like a top list of my favorite highlights of the trip altogether. But I think definitely the travel, going on the Shinkansen, that was so much fun. Also just eating the great food, are you kidding me? I mean, I have put on a lot of weight on this trip, let me tell you something. Things are not fitting the way they used to. But that's okay, because we were here to really enjoy it. And I'm gonna come home a slightly bigger, rounder, but happier, Lala. The whole four weeks about Nippon. Nippon, Nippon. Nippon, 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 Nippon. I'm sorry about them. Nippon, Nippon, Nippon. Yeah, shout out to Supersport. You know, I, I've said this before, but Supersport really is a world-class platform. And I feel it even more now after being a part of a tournament like the Rugby World Cup. I don't think a lot of people see that and know, you know, understand 
the, the ins and outs of television. It's not easy. Super sport, I mean, the guys don't sleep, the guys lose weight because they're not eating, because they're just working 24 hours a day, traveling um, and working on the trains and the airplanes and making sure that everything runs smoothly so that comes time to go live on air, it's looking good. And to be part of that kind of team, I mean, I'm so proud. And that brings Banzai to a close. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with us. What a once in a lifetime opportunity. Thank you for letting me show you my country, Japan. I've fallen in love with her all over again. I hope you enjoyed watching the show just as much as we enjoyed making it. Mzanzi, thank you for watching. Until next time, much love from your ninja.